back to our two-part webinar series on centrifugal pumping. Again, my name is Joe Stagg with Pipeline Development Company, and I am working together with Patterson Pumps on the release and production of these training webinars. Part one, we covered the fundamentals of a centrifugal pump, what a centrifugal pump is, how it works, how it operates, what it's designed to do, and how to properly select a pump. We did open up the uh, Patterson Pump Selection software. We looked at how to select a pump using their software as we analyzed Patterson Pump curves, and uh, not just curves that apply to them, but pump curves in general, how to read all the information on these curves and, and how to properly select a pump for an efficient application or to operate efficiently in any application. So in this next hour, what we would like to do is get more into integrating the pump with the system. Here at Pipeline Development Company, we are all about training. Uh, we, do, we do lots of training on our website at www.pipelinedevco.com. We have a lot of training there. We have a lot of uh, HVAC tools and steam system tools for people in the HVAC industry. And uh, we travel around North America teaching lots of different uh, uh, training seminars. So we're all about training. But when it comes to the HVAC system, I see way too many problems and mistakes that are made by engineers and contractors in the industry and sales reps. If you're a sales rep for Patterson Pumps, then you really need to learn this stuff as well. Too many problems come from the lack of integration. You have a hydronic system and you've got your HVAC pump and people are just throwing pumps in these applications and just walking away saying, okay, everything's fine and dandy. But the problem is they weren't integrated. We didn't integrate that. Integration becomes huge when we get into boilers, uh, when we get into chillers and cooling towers. It just becomes very, very important. Too many people think the pumps are a commodity. Well, you know, they, they kind of are a commodity item, but we better make sure that we're integrating that pump with the system. Otherwise, you're going to have disastrous effects across the, the entire operation of the project. So that's what I want to get into here. First of all, I want to get into the hydronic system. What is the hydronic system doing? What are the characteristics of that system that we need to consider before we even select a pump, before we even try to integrate a pump with that system? And then I want to get into the pump application. Once we understand the system, we've analyzed the system curves and how the system needs to operate, then we'll step back and we'll take a look at the pump We'll compare it with the pump curves, how the pump needs to operate or how we'd like the pump to operate, and then how we marry the two systems together. And then we'll get into some variable speed operation, variable speed applications and how the pump will operate under variable speed and what that does to the system. We'll look at drives, we'll look at how to control the drives and everything else. It's a lot of information that I want to give to you in just a short hour. Uh, again, we teach hydronics classes that are weeks in length. And so there's so much that we can share. Um, if, I know we're just skimming the surface here with a lot of this information, and I would really encourage you to check out our website uh, to get more information, to get more in-depth training on all of these topics. And if you have questions, we've got a great online community where you can get on and, and ask questions, get into some different discussions. Uh, there's always some great conversations that are running in our discussion forums. And, and like I said before, we've got lots of great tools to help you size and select different types of equipment or to size different loads in the system. So it should be very, very useful for you. Okay, I'd like to discuss the, uh, the different types of systems that we're going to see. Let's draw a typical, and what we're going to focus on here for this hour is a closed loop hydronic system. It could be cooling, it could be heating. Uh, I'll probably refer more to heating than anything. Uh, because up here in, in Salt Lake City, we've got a lot of heating loads. Now, I know you guys down south uh, who have the pleasure of living in very, very warm climates. You don't have to deal with the cold like those, those of us who are crazy living in the north. Uh, you don't, might not see as many heating applications. But again, hydronics is hydronics. So let's take a hydronic system that is closed loop. And I'm going to draw it like this just for the ease of, of drawing. Um, I'm going to pipe it in a direct return piping system. Again, we get into more basics on piping elsewhere, but we see reverse return, we see direct return, we can get into a one pipe system, a two pipe system, uh, a four pipe system, we can get into primary, secondary, variable primary, but what I want to talk about here is a direct return. So I've got a pump that is going to be distributing the water through the system, and let's say this is just a small system that has four 
different circuits. So I, here's my supply header. We go through these circuits, and here's my return header back to my system. And uh, direct return, uh, so we're entering this system first, and it's coming back. So if I'm a molecule of water getting from this point A to this point B, if everything had the same pressure drop, I'm going to want to take this closest circuit. Now, we spend a lot more time on this in our proportional balancing webinar, which is posted online. We also have some other uh, uh, balancing classes that have been posted and that will be posted to discuss this in much greater detail. But the point is, we've got to make sure that if I'm this molecule of water and I want to get from point A to point B, that I'm going to uh, be willing to take this path, this path, this path, or, or this path, it's all going to be equal pressure drop. So we get into balancing that system. Well, in each system, we're going to have our terminal unit, our, our heating or cooling coil, if you will. We will then have our control valve, and then we'll have our balancing valve. And of course, we're going to have isolation valves, service valves, uh, and other components here. But this is really what this whole system is about. We want to provide comfort to the occupants that are in this room. So this might be run off of a simple thermostat that's inside of that room. And this valve will open and close, modulate open and closed, to satisfy the, the heat demand here. If the occupants get cold in this room, then the thermostat starts to go down. This, this recognizes that, and it opens the valve so that we let more hot water through so that they can get the heating. This could be tied into a DDC system, a control system that's watching all of these different points and modulating everything to make it happen. But regardless, every system is going to have what we're showing here. Now, typically, in these systems, we will see the use of two-way control valves. However, we might have a three-way control valve at the end of that loop. This is what we would call a variable volume system. Now, I have people argue with me all the time that, no, your volume is never changing. You fill this water up with volume, and it, it holds the same volume. That's not the volume I'm talking about. I'm talking about the flow rate. The flow rate, the volume flow rate through the system will always change. So let's, let's talk about this. This is a two-way valve system. We might have a three-way valve or a couple of three-way valves to protect our components like the pump or a boiler or something else because if all of these valves were closed and this were a two-way valve and it were closed, this pump would be pushing against closed valves. No water would be moving. My pump would be deadheading. And that is not good on a pump. Two things will occur when we deadhead a pump. First of all, we're generating a lot of heat. That pump, its inefficiencies, as it's operating, that water's not moving, and we're adding heat into the water in the volute. Well, how much water's sitting in this volute? And you're talking mere gallon, if that. Or if it's a big pump, maybe a couple of gallons. You've got a little bit of water here. How long does it take to heat that water up so that we now fail our mechanical seals or we start to cavitate and boil? and kill the pump. So we have to prevent that. But we, we, teach, we give you some other formulas elsewhere where you can calculate how much flow you have to have to dissipate that heat. Usually, if with a 20 horsepower motor, usually it's about one gallon per minute. So just a little bit of flow will dissipate that heat into the system, let that water that we've added heat to out, and let colder water back in. So yeah, that's a concern, but why do we have such high minimum flow rates? In our previous class, we sized a pump for 750 gallons per minute, and the minimum flow rate was like 138 gallons per minute. Why so much? Well, when you look at a pump curve, and this comes out of ASHRAE, you'll have your best efficiency point right here. They have another curve out of the ASHRAE manual that shows this. These are the axial and thrust forces that are being driven on the pump. The further away you get from best efficiency point, the more forces that are going to be driven on that pump. You're going to have that pump vibrate. If you start to deadhead a pump at full speed, it may start to vibrate. What you're doing is you're killing your mechanical seals. You're killing your bearings. Uh, I've seen stainless steel shafts snap in half because we deadheaded a pump that was not supposed to be deadheaded. Uh, you flow too much out here. You're also going to 
create too many forces. That water's slamming into the eye of the impeller, and then it turns 90 degrees and lifts up off of that. We're creating axial and radial forces on that pump that should not be there and that will damage the pump. So that they, you know, they're going to pick you know, some type of minimum flow to protect that pump. If a manufacturer doesn't give it to you, the Patterson selection software does, but if they don't give it to you, the safe rule of thumb is about 25% flow of your best efficiency. So if my best efficiency point, or I guess it should have gone through there, if my best efficiency point was, or uh, flow was 1,000 gallons per minute, and they don't tell me what my minimum flow rate is, then it's safe to assume about 250 gallons per minute. So I'm going to need to have, if this is closed, this is closed, and this is closed, I'm going to have to have enough bypasses out here so that I can keep 250 gallons per minute flowing so that I do not damage my pump. When we apply a VFD to the pump, the rules start to change a bit. And once the VFD is applied, uh, as it slows everything down, we don't have to satisfy this anymore, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. So I call this a variable volume system. The alternative is to have a system that feeds all three-way valves. So just real quick, we'll draw a quick three system that's got the use of all three-way valves. In this system, if this circuit, if we don't want the heat through the coils, then we're going to bypass it. We'll close the inlet and we'll open the bypass. So my water will then travel around and through. This circuit might have 20 gallons per minute, 10 gallons per minute, 15 gallons per minute. Will my flow rate ever change? No, no, it won't, because I will either have 20 gallons per minute flowing here or 20 gallons per minute flowing here. It's very important that we locate the balancing valve so that we get that, but again, we talk about that elsewhere. But this system, I will have 20 gallons per minute no matter where, what position my valve is, because I'll be bypassing the rest of it that I'm starting to limit. Same here, same here. This pump will always flow 30, 45 gallons per minute. It will never change. This is what I would call a constant volume system. So now we don't have to worry about providing enough minimum flow to satisfy that pump because my, my flow rate is never changing. But as soon as I start to decrease my flow rate, we have to remember that this pump has a minimum flow demand. So we have to make sure to build that in. So a constant volume system and a variable volume system. They say that in any large application that's 300,000 BTUs or greater, in any commercial sized application that's feeding control valves, we have to be able to reduce our flow rate by at least 50%. There's also an option to reset our water temperature but uh, you can do one or the other. But for efficiency, we shouldn't listen. That's the baseline. For the efficiency, we should at least re uh, reduce our flow rate. Does this even make sense? Should I flow water all to all of these circuits if they don't need it? I'm wasting energy. Why flow 20 gallons per minute through here if I don't need it? Shut it off. Close it off. Put it in a two-way valve system. And now I no longer flow 20 gallons per minute. Let's say this is a constant speed pump. No VFDs being used. I put a constant speed pump on here. What happens? Does my flow rate change in my system? My speed still, my pump's still rotating at 1800 RPM on this curve. Is my flow rate going to change? Well, sure it is. What's happening? Well, this valve closed. I no longer flow 20 GPM through this circuit. I now try to squeeze that 20 GPM down this pipe. But did this pipe size change? No, it didn't. I squeeze as much as I can through here and through here, so I start to squeeze water through here. What happens is I squeeze more water through a set diameter of pipe. Exactly, my pressure is going to go up. So my flow, this was 
my point of operation with everything open 100%. However, this closed, my pressure went up, so as my pressure goes up, my flow rate decreases. Now, here's a question for all you designers out there. How often would I have all of my control valves open here or here at 100%? Now, think about it. Let's say it's a heating application. I sized these coils for so much flow rate, for so many BTUs per hour, and I need so much flow rate, and I need that how often? The coldest day of the year. The coldest day of the year outside. Okay? How much time do we spend at the coldest day of the year? Per the ASHRAE bin data, we're lucky if it's 2% of the year. So I will be at this condition only 2% of the year. I'll be where all of these valves are wide open 2% of the year. As it gets warmer outside, I don't have to produce as much heat, so these valves start to close. As these valves close, we restrict our flow. My flow rate starts to decrease. Okay? There's no way around it. That's what happens. So we can either do this and waste energy, or we can pay attention to the International Energy Conservation Code and do this and do a variable volume. By reducing our flow rate, all we have to have are a couple of valves, a couple of two-way valves. You put one two-way valve in, and the rest could be three ways, and your flow rate will now change with or without a VFD. That's just the design of the, the system. So now that we understand this system, we could look at the system curve. We come back here and we draw this pump curve. And let's say we wanted 25 gallons per minute, 30 gallons per minute, 10 gallons per minute, and 25. So what do we have? We have 50, 80, 90. This pump needs to produce 90 gallons per minute. And let's say as we calculated the head pressure through here, through here, 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 and back. And as we, again, we piped in, in parallel, so we find the worst case circuit and we, we balance everything to that, so we've got the pressure drop here. Let's say I'm pumping 90 gallons per minute at 55 feet of head. All right, so going back to what I just said, we will be doing this 2% of the year because we simply don't need that heat all the time. These are modulating control valves. So I sized my pump for 90 gallons per minute at 55 feet of head. But we'll only spend 2% of the year here. But let's ignore that. With all of these valves completely wide open, we could look at the affinity laws and we could come up with a system curve. We could calculate that. So without changing the position of these valves, if I dropped my flow rate down to 80 gallons per minute, then I've dropped it, you know, 10 GPM. That change, that ratio and change, I could square that change. Again, if, if, if you're not familiar with the affinity laws, I encourage you to go to our website at www.pipelinedevco.com and uh, we've got some calculators on there. We also have some classes that teach you about the affinity laws. But that change in ratio here, we square that, and that's how much my head will change by. So I can say, okay, at 80 gallons per minute, I will be here. At 70, I'll be here. At 60, here, and so on. You can keep going back, and we plot these points. As we go to 100, we go here, 110, and so forth, because it's a squared function. Okay, it's a, it's a squared difference when we go to our head pressures. So we can plot the system curve. That's what the system curve looks like if the valves never change positions. But will these valves be changing positions? Well, of course they will. These guys start to get warm. I don't need, a, I don't need 25 gallons per minute anymore. I only need 15. So this says, hey, I'm starting to get warm. Go ahead and throttle back. Or my DDC system says, hey, this room is getting warm. Go ahead and throttle back. We don't need as much heat. We can save some energy. So it starts to throttle this valve closed. So I no longer have 25 gallons per minute, I have 15 gallons per minute. The change, the pressure in my system just changed. I increase the pressure my pump has to see, I'm operating out over here. Well, guess what? There's a new curve for that. Now it just, this one modulated. Now I'm here. 
This one modulates a little more. Now I'm here. This one modulates open a little bit more. Now I'm back here. This one starts to modulate. Now I'm back here. So I'm creating infinite points. If I have modulating valves, I have infinite points on my pump curve. I have infinite system curves like this. So my system is always changing and my system curve is always changing because of the modulating control valves. That is how the system operates. So what do we do? Well, like we said before, we could leave a constant speed pump in here. It's violating, uh, based on the energy code, the International Energy Conver Con Conservation Code, currently it, it says that if I have a, a pump that's feeding a variable volume system with control valves and my motor is five horsepower and up, then I need to use VFDs. It's in the, it's in the Energy Conservation Code. It's there. We have to do this. So now if we're less than three horsepower or less, less than five horsepower, we don't have to, but we still might want to consider it because there's some good energies to be saved here. And, and VFDs have come down in cost and continue to come down in cost where it makes sense, hey, I put a three horsepower motor in there, it could pay itself off pretty quick, uh, a three horsepower VFD on that motor. Okay? But if I don't, if I don't pay attention to that or I have an existing application that I'm, I'm going to ignore that with, am I saving energy? I start to come back here. Am I saving energy by coming back here? Some people say, no, no, you're not saving energy. Well, you can see on the pump curve, if you look at your horsepower lines, your horsepower lines drop like this. Right here, let's say this was uh, three horsepower. This was two horsepower. This was one and a half horsepower. If I was right here at my uh, design point, my brake horsepower might be 2.4. But as these start to close, yeah, check this out. Now I'm, I'm operating at 2. I just saved energy. Now the one downside to this is your efficiency curves. And again, we, this is a, a review of what we discussed in the first session. Our efficiency curves look like this. So as you get further away from this point, you're operating less efficiently. So is this the best way to go? Yes, we do conserve energy, but I'll tell you right now, because of the affinity laws, and again, we could spend a whole couple of hours talking about the affinity laws, but based on the affinity laws, if instead of producing this much pressure, I only need 55 pressure, 55 feet, to get 90 GPM through the system. So as my valves close and as I create more pressure, I don't need that much. Now I'm pushing out 58 feet. I don't need 58 feet. I only need a 55 feet. Why am I wasting that much? I could drop it, instead of operating here, I could be operating here on a different pump curve. And now I'm producing a whole lot less energy. Look at my brake horsepower now. Instead of being up here at 2, I'm down here at maybe 1.75. So again, this can all be calculated with mathematical equations, but it makes sense to put a VFD on here if we start to do this because I can save a lot more energy. And where these pumps could be operating 24-7 during the heating season or 24-7 during the cooling season or 24-7 year round, you start to do this and that doesn't take very long to pay that VFD back. You could have it paid back within a year or less. You just have to make sure that the system is operating properly so that we can get the greatest turndown on that VFD. I do want to get into a little bit into the balancing of the system. Um, keep in mind that this circuit, let's just throw some different flow rates up here. This circuit wants 20 gallons per minute, the circuit wants 10, the circuit wants 35, and then the circuit wants 5. So we're looking at 40, 50, 70. 70 gallons per minute. That's what my system requires. I've got a need for 70 gallons per minute when it's uh, let's say it's my design temperature outside is zero degrees Fahrenheit outside, whoops, yeah, outside air temperature. OK, 
Okay, so that's how much flow I'm going to need for my total heat transfer. Well, how do I know that I'm going to have 20 gallons per minute here? I'm a molecule of water, and I've got to travel from point A to point B. What path am I going to take? Well, we have to put in these balancing valves, and we have to set these balancing valves to rates so that if I'm sitting here, I, I could take this route or I could take this route, and it's going to be the same amount of effort. Remember, I'm a molecule of water. I want to take the path of least resistance. If it doesn't cost me a lot of energy to go this route, then we're all going to go that route. Now, so much of us are going to go that route that we start to have traffic accidents, traffic jams. And that's going to make some of us say, hey, whoa, 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 I don't want to wait in that traffic accident. I don't want to wait in that line. So we're going to just go out a little bit further around the valley and take the next interstate and bring it in. Now that one starts to get crowded. So now we're going to start to do this. We're going to flood these circuits, and we're going to starve these circuits. That's the nature of a direct return system. So we have to build in the balancing valves so that we can establish that. Well, now my pump starts to turn down. We're, uh, with the VFD, we start to say, well, you know, we want to start changing this. Well, let's, let's lay this out first. Let's say that this circuit requires, I've got a 12-foot uh, loss here. Now, I'm not going to size control valve authority right now because of lack of time. But control valve authority is very, very important in our hydronic pumping applications. So we do teach some classes online about uh, control valve authority. But for this discussion, let's just put this equal to this. So 12 feet and 12 feet. Now let's say this guy, in order to get the flow out to the furthest remote system, this has to be set pretty high to 15 feet. Uh, this one is 10 and uh, let's say 10. And then here, we've, we set this at 8 feet. This one is uh, 12, 12, and this would be, again, we've got losses here in the pipe that we're not accounting for. I don't want to worry about that right now. So we'll set this to um, 5 feet. And then this would be set to 3 feet, and this would be 12 feet also and 12 feet. Okay, if I have a system like this, what we've got to look at is, what is the pressure drop to get through a circuit? Because I want 20 gallons per minute to flow through this circuit when this control valve is all the way open. This room gets cold. These people need heat. So we open that th uh, two-way control valve all the way, and we need 20 gallons per minute to travel through that circuit. Well, what if to do that, to get 20 gallons per minute through the circuit, I need 12 plus 12, 12, 12, and 15 equals... 39 feet. So I need a 39 foot. My pump needs to provide between point C and point D, I need to provide 39 feet of pressure differential. What if I only provide 20 feet of pressure differential? Let's say that my pump is undersized or my pump is operating at a lower speed and I'm only providing 20 feet. What creates flow? Pressure creates flow. I don't have as much pressure well, this coil has so many uh, tubes in it. This valve is sized for a certain C sub V. This balancing valve is set to a certain closure rate. Well, that being said, if I don't give it 39 feet, I don't have 20 GPM. We could calculate this with the affinity laws. What's the difference here? The ratio, take the square root of that and put us back up here to determine what our flow rate change. But the point is, I'm not providing enough pressure. I don't have 20 GPM. So these guys get cold, that valve opens, and I'm only providing 20 feet of head, I am underflowing that circuit. Everybody in that room is cold and it's not getting hot, uh, hot fast enough because I'm not providing enough heat. I might not even be able to put enough heat compared to what I'm losing through the walls. So, this is what we would call the minimum control head for that circuit. I always have to make sure that I'm providing 39 feet of head through that circuit. What about this circuit? Well, I've got 10 plus 10, plus 8, so I've got a need for 28 feet. If I don't have 28 feet of pressure between these points, then I will not be able to flow 10 gallons per minute. What about this circuit? 12 plus 12 plus 5, that is 29 feet. If I don't have 29 feet between this point and this point, I won't be able to get 35 gallons per minute through there. 
and then here and here. 12 plus 12 plus 3 is 27 feet. Same story. So every circuit has a minimum control head. We have to make sure that we don't drop below that control head or we don't drop below that pressure because if we do, this valve opens all the way up. I want 35 gallons per minute. I better have 29 feet of head between these two points. If I don't, if I only have uh, 27 feet of head, well, I can't get 35 gallons per minute anymore. This is what we would call establishing a balanced system. I want 20 GPM. When it opens, I better have 20 GPM. The definition of a balanced system has been around for, for decades. And it says that in order to be a balanced system, you must be plus or minus 10% of your design flow. If you're outside of this range on the high end, then you are, in, by definition, unbalanced. So this one could go from, uh, let's write with orange, we could go minus 10% or plus 10%. We could go from 18 to 22. This could go from 9 to 11. This one could go from, let's round down, so it could go from 32 to 38. This one could go from 4, not even 4, to 6. But as long as we're doing that, we're balanced. But if I don't provide enough pressure through these circuits, if my pump is not sized to do that, then I'm unbalanced. This is what we're going to call our minimum control head because I want to start, I've got a system that has two-way valves. I've got a code that tells me I have to use VFDs. So if I want to change the position of these modulating valves, they start to close. I don't need to put out that much pressure anymore. So I can now start to crank, I can put a VFD on there and I can crank the speed of my pump down. So let's look at a pump curve. Go purple again. Flow, pressure, and my pump curve. This is at 1800 RPM. Okay. This is my point of operation, and I know that I've got to establish some type of minimum control head. What we've got to do is locate a differential pressure sensor that says, okay, I, let's, let's make this my worst case loop. So this one's requiring 29. So we locate a differential pressure sensor across here, and that wiring comes back to my VFD panel. And in here, this controls my pump. In here, we say never drop below 29 feet. As long as I'm maintaining 29 feet across this circuit, then I will have my proper flow rate. I will be able to pass 35 GPM through that circuit. If it let it get down to 25 feet across here, when that valve opens up, I don't have that flow. I'm not balanced anymore. I now have uncomfortable occupants. So to make sure that doesn't happen, I need to establish this as my minimum set point. So my pump was sized for uh, we are 70 GPM and, and I think we said 55 feet of head. Okay, 70 gallons per minute at 55 feet of head. So my pump is operating way up here to 55 feet. But I can't just assume that my pump curve could operate down here, could it operate down here, 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 all the way down to 10%. I can't make that assumption. Because, yeah, that would be nice. My pump's operating at very, very slow speeds. I'm providing very, very little flow, but my pressure's gone. If I don't provide any pressure, do I have balanced flow through the circuit? I can't do this. I have to find a point where I'm providing at least 29 feet of head. So we go from 55 down to 29. This, my pump can never operate down in this range because that is set to 29 feet. If I operate down here, 
If I let my pump slow down so much that I'm down in this range, I'm not providing enough pressure to satisfy this point, to satisfy this pressure here and then give me my flow rate. I'm unbalanced and I'm not providing enough heat transfer here to keep my occupants comfortable. So my pump, my VFD will be able to slow my pump between these values 29 feet here and 55 feet maximum here. And it will modulate itself, it will control itself so that we can keep this value satisfied. My system curves will still look the same. We'll have all these infinite system curves that we're trying to ride on, but instead they're coming out of this box like this. So if my pump, if we start reading across this circuit, we only need 29 feet. Well, when everything's open 100%, then I know that I'm providing 29 feet. I'm reading 29 feet. But this guy starts to close. So I squeeze water through here. Well, I, I don't need to squeeze water through there anymore, so I start to crank my VFD down. So my VFD, my pump doesn't have to operate at 1800 RPM anymore. I'm operating down here at maybe 1600 RPM. Okay, so now I'm providing less pressure because I don't have to provide that pressure through this pipe anymore. Well, because I don't have flow through here, I just cut 20 GPM out of, I don't need to flow 20 GPM. I don't need 70 GPM, I only need 50 gallons per minute. So this pressure drop in this distribution pipe just went way down because this was sized for 70 gallons per minute. Now I'm only doing 50 gallons per minute. The pressure drop just went way down in that pipe. So that's where I get my benefit from. It's not the circuits, it's the distribution pipe. So now this guy closes. So I now no longer have flow through here. I don't need 10 gallons per minute anymore. I, I, so I was flowing 70, I don't need 20, I don't need 10, so now I'm only flowing 40 gallons per minute for these two circuits. Well, this pipe right here, which was sized for 70, is now only flowing 40. There's some big savings there. This pipe that was sized for 50 is only flowing 40. There's savings here. So my pump doesn't have to operate as fast. It can now operate down here to maybe 1500 RPM. We can calculate all this. We could plug in the affinity laws and determine exactly what our pressure drop would be or our speed would be. So that's how this thing is operating. It's looking at this point and saying, hey, I don't care what's going on in the distribution pipe. I don't care how much pressure I have to overcome. My VFD is going to slow me down so that I at least provide 29 feet here. So, what you need to look at is this value versus this value. The larger the difference between what your pump is sized for versus what the minimum pressure drop is for your minimum control head in your index circuit, the greater that difference, the more turndown your pump will have. So let's just run it uh, again. I know we haven't talked about the affinity laws here, but let's just look how much savings we have. If my pump can slow down from 55 to 29, my old pressure was 55 feet. My new pressure is 29 feet. What I want to get now, again, we, we break this down in our affinity law class, but there's three tiers. Your tier number one is flow and speed and diameter and, and uh, uh, hertz. Tier number two is pressure and tier number three is power. Well, we're dealing with pressure right now. This is a squared function and this is a cubed function and this is linear. So with the pressure, I'm working right here. My old pressure is 55, my new pressure is 29. What's that going to do to my, new, um, to my new flow? So what we would do is we would uh, divide that out. So that change, if I take 29 divided by 55, that equals 0.527. So in other words, I have reduced my pressure by 40, almost 
I'm sorry, 47%. So 47% reduction in pressure. If we take, again, I'm here, and I want to get up to here. I take the square root of that because we're getting back up to this tier. I take the square root of 0.527, and that equals 0.726. That means my flow rate has changed by, uh, let's see, 726 would be 28, almost 28 percent is what it changed by. My speed has also reduced. So if I need to do this, I can now calculate what my new RPM was. If my original RPM was 1800, what is my new RPM? Well, we take our old RPM, uh, so our, our speed 2, our new speed, is equal to my old speed times this number right here, 0.726, because it's linear. So 1800 times 0.726 is 1307. My new speed is equal to 1307. So instead of operating at 1800 RPM, to satisfy this right here, I would be on a curve that was at 1307 RPM because of the affinity laws. I can calculate that. But that's not why we put the VFD in there. The reason we have the VFD is because we want to save energy. We want to save power. So I just had a 28% reduction in my speed. But what did I save in my power? So my new power, power 2, is equal to my power 1, my old power, times this right here, this reduction, this 0.726. And to get from here down to here, we would cube it. Okay, so we take 0.726 and cube that. It's 0.383. So my power has reduced by 62%. Look at that. So I was able to slow my pump down by 28% of its original speed. That gave me um, 40, what did we write here, 48, 48% reduction in pressure. But it gave me a 62% reduction in power. This is why VFDs are so important. So let me lay out another example for you. We had a system in, this was years ago, did a job up in uh, the state of Idaho where it was a primary, secondary, tertiary. Primary, secondary, tertiary. We had a primary heating loop in the boiler mechanical area. We had a secondary distribution loop through the entire campus. And then we had tertiary loops that went off into each building. Well, they added a new building. And they had their secondary loop traveling through in the grounds. This is the supply. This is the return. So they built a, pri a, a crossover loop between the two and balanced it. And then they came off of this up into the mechanical space in this, in this room. But all this fed was a big air handling unit and one little um, unit heater inside the space. So they had a pump that pumped through these components and back in. The, this pressure through my distribution pipe was a big old fat, almost zero. This pump was sized for about 38 feet of head. The pressure drop through the air handling unit alone was 35 feet of head. That's through this circuit, through the air handling unit coil, the control valve, and the balancing valve, and the, and the service valves. So now what we're looking at is a different scenario than what we had here. If I've got a pump curve where my pump is sized, for 38 feet, and my minimum control head is at 35 feet, that means I cannot pump down in here. My system curves will just be like this. My pump can only turn down three feet of pressure. Does it make sense to put a VFD on there? Will it pay itself back? Well, let's take a look at it. Let's run it through the affinity laws again. Dealing with the pressure, 
So 35 divided by 38. 35 divided by 38 is equal to 0.92. My pressure reduced by 8%. Okay? I need to come back up here to my flow, so I take the square root of that. Square root of that is 0.96. 0.96, that means my speed only dropped by 4%. So if I was 1,800 RPM, now I'm only 1,727 RPM. I still have to put out 727 RPM to maintain this minimum pressure. It's not looking good, is it? But now we cube that. Let's take this 0.96 and cube it. I'm able to reduce my power by 0.88. I reduced it by 12%. How long does this reduction in power take to pay back that VFD? We have to look how often is that pump running. Is it operating for a long period of time? Is it not? If it is, if it's running 24-7, it will pay itself back. It won't pay itself back in months or maybe a year or two years. It depends on the size of the motor. But it will pay itself back over time because we're still, if it's operating all the time, we're seeing a, a, a fairly decent savings. But that's what you want to look at is the difference between these two values, what your pump is sized for and your minimum control head, and what's the reality of it being able to, you know, really turn down. We've talked about the affinity laws. We've talked about... Uh, uh, changing the rotating of our, of our the rotating speed of our pump. Uh, we've talked about trimming impellers in our last class and in our last webinar. And I did mention in that last webinar that when you look at a pump curve and you have your maximum impeller trim, you have your minimum impeller trim, and you trim your impellers to these different conditions, that as you trim those impellers, you're making this can inside of the other can this distance between the two walls is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, so your efficiencies are decreasing. Your efficiency goes down. Now, one thing I want you to be aware of is this is, uh, if, if this is the impeller trim that I have, let's say this is a 9-inch impeller trim. This is also 1,800, and I'm rotating 1,800 RPM. I could trim my impeller down to 8 inches and keep that at 1800 RPM and I would operate on this curve. The other option is if we take, and again I'm, I'm applying the affinity laws here, if I decide what the change in ratio is, if I take 8 inch trim divided by 9 inch trim, how much did I change it by? If I take 8 divided by 9, I had a 0.889 reduction. So I reduce the size of my impeller by a, just over about 11 percent. Okay? I would now go from this curve to this curve and I'd be operating on this curve. Or I could change my speed from 1800 RPM, change it by 11 percent, so 1800 times 8.889. Now my new speed is 1600 RPM. So I could trim my impeller from 9 inches to 8 inches, or I could reduce my, my speed from 1,800 to 1,600 RPM. It's almost the same thing. Now I say almost, why? Here, I'm increasing the gap between the spaces. I lose efficiency by doing that. Here, I still have a full-size impeller. All I did is slow it down. I didn't increase this gap. I didn't decrease my efficiency. I can maintain the same efficiency. The other nice thing is what if I realized after I trimmed it that I've got to get back up to there. I can't paste or tape the metal back on. I've got to go buy a new impeller. Here, all I have to do is speed it back up. I can trim and untrim an impeller as much as I want to. 
That's a benefit that the VFD gives to us by using this in the pump. So now, where we talk about how a pump is so much more efficient with a full size impeller because of the limited gap between the two walls, the, 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 I'm not having that efficiency loss that I had before. If I put a full size impeller in all of my pumps, I don't need to operate up here, I need to operate here. My point of operation is right here where I would use a seven inch trim. It doesn't cost me a whole lot of any money to put a full nine inch impeller in there. I don't need it. I don't need to be up here. I need to be right here. And then I put a VFD on my pump. I haven't given up the inefficiencies. Check this out. I need a nine inch or I put a nine inch or I could trim it down to seven inch. What's that change? 7 divided by 9 is equal to 0.778. So I would trim my impeller by 22%. Or I put that full size impeller in there and I install a VFD. I go from 1800 RPM, instead of operating at 1800 RPM to meet my design point condition, I would only have to operate at 1400 RPM. I still have a full size impeller in there, so I still operate on those efficiency curves. I don't have the gap here. My pump is operating more efficiently and it's operating at a slower speed. I'm not wasting energy. I did have to pay for that VFD, but code tells us you have to put a VFD in there anyway. We designed the system right, we integrate the pump right, and we have a very efficient operation. These are the tools, this is the knowledge that we all need to have. We need to understand the system. If you're out there selling pumps, you can be just like every other pump salesman and sell on the bells and whistles of your pump. You can go out there if you're selling Patterson pumps and you can push the heck out of it and say, my pump does this, my pump does this, it looks like this and, and here's why you want it. But you can provide more value to your customers if you can walk in and say, yeah, I got a pump. I got a great pump. Patterson Pump makes a great pump. Let me help you integrate it with the system. Let's take this pump and put it in the system and do this, and let's do this, and let's make it much more efficient. Let's change the piping in our distribution piping. We can turn down our flow, our, our speed even more, and we can save that much more energy. These are the tools that you need in your arsenal to become more efficient and to offer a better service to your customer. If you're an engineer, you owe it to yourselves to know this because you can provide a better solution to your customer with this knowledge. Mechanical contractor, you owe it to yourself to know this so that you can install a better efficient system for your customer. If you're a maintenance technician or a building operator, you need to understand this so you can make your own systems operate properly. It's valuable knowledge that we offer. And again, with Pipeline Development Company, we are all about that education. We are all about sharing the knowledge that we have and that we've obtained over the, the many, many, many years that we've been in this business as reps. We've worked as reps for, for uh, over uh, two decades. We've, uh, we've worked as engineers. We've worked as consultants. We've installed systems. We've started boilers. We've started pumps. We've, we've worked on air handling unit systems. We've got experience and knowledge that we've gained over the 30 plus years we've all accumulated in the business so that we can share that with you. This knowledge is so important so that you can make these systems work, so that you can select the right pump, the right Patterson pump for your application and then make that application, integrate that pump in that system so that you have the ultimate efficiency that you can obtain.